So welcome everyone to um, um, this evening. Thank you very much for setting the time aside to listen to me. Um, good news is we don't have many slides to run through. It's sort of the format is um, six main slides. And then as Chris said, you're more than welcome to um, have a copy of the slide deck. And inside the slide deck, um, we, we sort of put a lot of information in there. We've put a much deeper sort of dive into the business within the slide deck itself in the appendices. Um, we've also put a financial review in there too. Um, and, and, and if you're interested in the operational side of how our business works, um, please, as I say, have a look at the, um, the deeper slide deck. So, um, so first of all, just a brief introduction to, um, there are two of us here um, today um, presenting. Louise, my CFO, will join me for the Q&A. Thank you very much. So firstly, um, Introduction to, to me, Dorian, from the, the, the CEO, 22 years in the property sector, 16 years with Belfar. Um, I've also spent five years on a voluntary basis as a director of the property ombudsman. So if you've ever had cause to complain about a, a property firm in the, uh, in the UK, um, generally complaints are fed through a free redress scheme called the property ombudsman. And um, as I say, I was sort of instrumental in, in the development of the ombudsman um, over a five year period. And I sat on the board, I'm not there anymore, um, but I was until 2018. Um, Louise, who's with me this evening, 17 years experience as a board member on AIM listed businesses and seven years with Balfour. And um, you know, we, we make a pretty formidable um, sort of partnership. Louise, fantastic CFO. Um, just to give you an example of our sort of growth, our EPS, has increased by 165% over the last um, over the last four years. And if you haven't sort of heard of us before, um, we are a profitable business. Our revenue is 21.7 million. Um, profit before tax is 6.7 million. Um, net debt at the end of last year, 3.7 million. And we do pay a dividend, and we've always paid a dividend since listing on AIM in 2012. Um, like a lot of firms, we suspended um, last year's March dividend temporarily just so we could really see how see the lie of the land um, sort of um, as the pandemic unfolded um, we have reinstated that dividend and on top of that we have also repaid all government furlough monies and grant money which I appreciate there are different schools of thought on you know whether companies should repay or not um, I certainly wouldn't want to advise either way but you know we, we took the view as a board that we we'd had a great year last year despite COVID um, and we thought it was the best thing to do so that's the introduction done um, okay so who and what are we so we are a multi-brand property franchise group um, we have grown to 418 individual physical offices over five distinct brands it's actually now six distinct brands we acquired another business two weeks ago called nicholas humphreys it's just the bottom of this slide which i'll come on to in a second so so just to give you an idea of, of sort of how we operate so we are at our heart we are a franchise business so across these 418 offices we have franchisees in the vast majority of them so franchisee has a hundred percent skin in the game i'm personally very pro franchising there are some brilliant franchise models um, in the uk and when when franchising is done well and the franchisor um, invests trains supports the franchisees the franchise is rewarded with a small cut of the franchisees turnover um, but ultimately our risk is now spread across lots of offices all over the country and, and as I say when it's done well the franchisee builds a great business at ground level and the franchise all benefits from the scale of an operation such as ours. So 418 individual businesses um, across um, five key five key brands when you put the sixth brand on which is Humphreys the acquisition we completed on um, a couple of weeks ago we in real time we're now at 439 um, offices across our network and I'll explain a little bit more about them so firstly um, Belvoir um, is primarily a lettings franchise operates from shops and offices um, across the country uh, manages properties on behalf of landlords um, it is a little bit of a state agency, but 90% of the revenue that franchisees generate within Belvoir comes from residential letting, so normal tenancy agreements and managing properties on behalf of landlords. Um, there are around 2.5 million 
um, landlords across the uh, the UK. And we have a, another network called Northwood, which we acquired um, in 2016. Northwood, very similar to, um, I, I know I've skipped Newton Fowler, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, Northwood we acquired in 2016, and why I've skipped on to that one, um, the Northwood is very similar to Belvoir. It's a residential lettings business. 90% of its revenue comes from residential lettings, 10 from a state agency. And why I just wanted to highlight that, um, during the first lockdown last year, we were told to close our doors, as were many other businesses. The the franchisees operating in a, in the letting space, which is Balfour and Northwood, um, you know, 260 offices, um, they retain 90% of their revenue, even with their doors closed. Um, so just to be clear about that, where they had to close their doors, they couldn't operate, they couldn't do viewings, but we continue to manage properties behind the scenes, and, um, and as I say, they retain 90% of their revenue um, with their doors closed. Newton, Fallowell and Lavelle, different. Um, they are very much East Midlands um, based, which is where we, we started 25 years ago. Um, Newton Fallowell we acquired in 2015 and Lavelle we acquired in January last year um, and I must admit you know when we completed on Lavelle in January and I could see what was happening in Italy with the uh, pandemic unfolding um, I must admit I thought at the time that you know our, our timing probably could have been better however as the year unfolded um, a state agency became very busy um, due to a number of factors. One was the pent-up demand due to lockdowns. Another factor was a stamp duty holiday, which you may be aware of, um, which meant there's been intense activity across the housing sector. And in fact, house prices have pushed up by 8% um, last year, simply down to demand activity. Um, so Newton Fallowell and Lavelle are, are different to Belvoir and Northwood. They're primarily estate agents, and 25% of their revenue comes from lettings but 75% comes from a state agency. And the brand we acquired a couple of weeks ago, Humphreys, um, that's a student lettings business, so different again. Um, it's on our doorstep. It was started in Loughborough. It operates mainly in, in university towns, um, and it operates from 21 offices, 18 of which are franchised, three of which are corporately owned. Um, they're very similar to what we did in Lavelle 12 months ago. With the three corporate offices, um, we intend to franchise them out eventually. Um, in Lavelle, when we acquired that in January last year, it had five corporate offices. Over the year, we franchised them out. We completed the last franchising franchised office in, in January. And, and what that means essentially is that we paid, for instance, in Lavelle, we originally paid two million pounds for that business. Um, after we'd franchised the corporate offices, it brought the consideration down to 1.2 million. Um, the EBITDA forecast going forward in Lavelle alone um, is 300,000, um, so it's a four times multiple. So hopefully that explains, you know, sort of why we're buying these small networks and um, and bolting them in. But as I said, across the whole business, you know, our profit is um, before tax is 6.7 um, million. That's up 20% on the previous year. Um, Mortgage Advice Bureau, um, again, an AIM, an AIM listed company in its own right. Um, we've built from a standing start back in 2016, uh, we've built a significant uh, mortgage business. We wrote 12,000 mortgages last year, just to give you an example. And in Q1 this year, we wrote um, four mortgages already just in the first quarter um, significant um, business 202 advisors we had at year end um, in real time we're now up to 212 advisors we've added a further 10 um, since the start of this year so I mean really I mean it hopefully you can see what we doing with Mortgage Advice Bureau. We've got a brilliant property network. We've got all of these transactions happening across the UK and we simply want to overlay mortgage advisors across our existing nationwide footprint of, uh, of property franchises. That's our strategy. And um, um, there is a lot more detail on that within the slide deck. Um, but that strategy, um, we're we sort of still at the start in my mind of, of the rollout of, um, of, of mortgage advice, but to reach 212 advisors is, is significant. MAB, which is listed on AIM, um, as MAB is the ticker, um, that the, the wider business has about 1,400 advisors, I believe, um, over 200 of which are, are our advisors. They are our advisors. We just choose to partner with uh, MAB, who, in my experience, have been fantastic. So, on to the next slide. 
So just a few sort of highlights, you know, a few a few I've already mentioned. So, you know, revenue 21.7 million, that's up 13% last year. Um, profit before tax 6.7 million, that's up 20% um, last year. Um, MSF, so all, if, if you're a franchise business, um, a franchisee operates as your brand, they use your website, training, compliance, systems, maybe access to clients. Um, so franchisees buy into the concept and trade as your brand. Um, and in return, they pay a percentage of their gross turnover across to the franchisor, which some people call royalties, some people call management service fee. We happen to call it management service fee, shortened to MSF. Um, so MSF was up 3% last year. Um, and bear in mind that, you know, for a, a short period during the year, our doors were completely closed. We couldn't operate um, due to COVID. Um, EPS, which I touched on earlier, um, was up 14% last year. Um, and over a four year period, it's up 165%. Um, the operational highlights, I mentioned Lavelle, um, I mentioned the number of offices. So without the acquisition of Humphreys, we grew our office base, our physical footprint by 6% last year. Um, and we've we've added a further 21 offices to that total um, in, in, in Q1 this year, well, two weeks ago. Um, financial advisors um, up 22%. So again, that was from a standing start in 2016. Um, we've added a further 10 um, um, so far this year. And an NBS, so NBS stands for the Nottingham Building Society. Um, last year, I said to investors that we had entered into a partnership with, um, with NBS, um, a strategic sort of alliance, whereby they have a state, a, a real estate a, 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 a branch network. They've got about 50 branches across the sort of East Midlands um, centered around Nottingham. And um, historically, they've offered an estate agency service and a letting service to their clients. They decided they didn't want to do that anymore, and we have partnered with them to occupy their premises and offer estate agency and letting services to their clients. So, so a little bit later in the presentation, I'll show you a picture of that in action. Um, so we are, you know, in, in, in the shop windows, we, we have branding in their windows too, a desk in some places and a staff member in other places. So, you know, we're very early with that alliance. Um, we've so far uh, moved into 11 of their offices and that's exactly what I said would happen six months ago. I said we'd finish the year occupying 10 to 10 to 15 of these outlets. Um, we intend to occupy a further 19 this month, so we'll finish the half year occupying around um, 30 um, of the Nottingham Building Society High Street offices. Okay, so I mentioned that um, we've got some pictures. So we've got some pictures of offices. Um, Lavelle, which I touched on earlier, um, that's a you know relatively small estate agency uh, network. Purchased it last year, and you can see the numbers on the screen. Um, earnings secretive, um, four times multiple, um, and a great acquisition for us. That was last January. Um, NBS Nottingham. I mentioned on the previous slide, and if you can see, if you've got really good eyesight, you can see the um, the sort of square in the the, the Nottingham's window. Um, that's our co-branding. Um, it's all they're all pretty much like that. Some have got bigger branding, some have got smaller. It depends on the shop front. And, and as I say, watch this space. Um, as they say, we're going to sort of expand on this relationship with the Nottingham over the next um, next few months. So more to come on that side. And um, Humphreys. Um, the acquisition I, I mentioned at the beginning, consideration of 4 million. Um, turnover um, in the previous um, year was 2.8 million, um, operating profit of a million. There are three corporate outlets, as I said earlier, uh, um, within Humphreys that we intend to franchise out. Um, so that's just an idea of, of, of what we look like sort of out in the field. So really just to sum up, um, so why invest in, in Belvoir? Um, Six brands and and the six brands is really helpful because it we, we we've helped franchisees over the last five years to buy a hundred acquisitions, believe it or believe it not, we reached that milestone a few months ago, so our franchisees within these brands are acquiring their their competitors, and we fully support that we help with funding and we help with operational um, expertise so the six brands is a is a good thing, and as I said earlier, you know I'm really passionate about franchising a franchiser franchisee is an entrepreneur, and when for instance last year when the last the first lockdown was was on, we, we were released, um, we didn't have to persuade our franchisees to get out there and open their doors. 
you couldn't hold them back. You know, franchisees are driven individuals. They want to grow their business every single year. And therefore, we've had 24 years of unbroken profit growth with uh, with EPS up significantly. Um, very strong management team with 12 years average length of service. We've got MDs in all of these brands, um, very experienced people. Um, the longest serving MD has been with me for 15 years. As I say, this is my sort of 16th year with uh, with Belfort. Um, high degree of recurring revenue. It's a high quality income stream. So 60% of gross profit comes from recurring lettings. Tenants pay their rent, we charge a fee, pass the residual to the landlord, and we manage the property. So this, this pours in whether our doors are open or closed. We've recently diversified into both estate agency and financial services. When we listed our AIM, we were a lettings business solely, um, but we've diversified just to really expand our product range. And you can see how this is going. So um, financial services, um, gross profit up from 300,000 in 2016, to 2.8 million last year and we've got quite some way still to take that strategy and um, and at corporate acquisition level we've acquired seven um, in the last um, five years um, and we will continue with that strategy going forward so a strong strategy for growth um, we're a dividend paying business we're profitable um, and at the heart of all of our branches our offices and um, we have a franchisee with a hundred percent skin in the game very driven people um, so really just to sum up and then we'll move on to uh, Q&A and I'm definitely within time. Um, so really, uh, where are we right now, you know, in, in sort of real time? Well, performance in Q1 um, is in line with management expectations. We've also got the backdrop of a very buoyant housing market on both lettings and sales. We haven't needed that historically. Um, you know, it's the icing on the cake as far as I'm concerned. And I suspect that we want to sort of um, government interventions. There, there are new government backed mortgages about to be released. Um, we think that the uh, you know the market is likely to perform pretty well this year, and I suspect beyond that, um, house prices are rising, rents are rising. The market sort of obviously moves around, but we're very experienced in in dealing with a difficult market. You know, we traded successfully. We floated on the back of the financial crash. We're used to dealing with difficult markets, um, but obviously we might, we'll make the most of uh, of good markets like we're doing at the moment. So I think that brings me to the end of the um, the presentation. Yes, we've got some good questions come through. Um, a very informative presentation. I'll go straight to the questions. Given the good levels of cash generation, would you ever consider buying back and cancelling shares in order to boost EPS? Louise, think, do you want to go for that one? Yeah, I'll come back. I think, that, as you can see, um, over recent years, you know, we've, we've always found something quite useful and quite um, <laughs> earnings accretive to do with our cash. We do actually have a, a degree of bank debt on the balance sheet, so I guess the first quarter call would probably be to reduce that in any case. Um, our net debt EBITDA ratio is at 0.5, so it's not particularly high, but I would I would say the desire to buy back shares wouldn't be high while there's better things that we can do with the cash. Yeah, the net debt was three was just 3.7 million at the, the year end, so um, yeah, that was the, the position. We've spent some since then, but likewise, we've generated some as well, so it just moves around. But um... Yeah, okay. Um, as you say, the uh, housing market's buoyant, um, and you pay a dividend, which is obviously very pleasing for many. Um, would there be a, a chance of an increase to shareholders in the dividend policy? Yeah, it's, it's a good, it's a good think, question. Um, no, yeah, please, I've go that as well. We um, we actually ended up with a dividend cover of 2.1 um, times this year, but we do we are, we do look at it at around two, and that's partly because we want to retain money in the business to do sort of earnings enhancing acquisition activities as we have done, and meanwhile we also want to reward shareholders. So I guess that's the sort of um, benchmark figure that we could be looking at going forward. So. Um, I think there will be an increase um, this year, um, and, um, and and that's the sort of measure that we'll be looking at. Okay. Yeah. Before, well, just on that point, Chris. Sorry, yeah. Chris. Just on that point. We, um, you know, before sort of COVID hit, we had committed to a sort of progressive dividend policy, yeah. um, sort of weighted towards the second half of the year. That's what we said, sort of pre uh, pre COVID. Okay. Um, and moving on to COVID, actually, <laughs> a few questions have come in, as you can well imagine. Um, I'll, I'll just roll these into a couple. Uh, how many properties have rent arrears due to COVID 
and what impact will rent arrears have on the business? You know, that, that is that is a very good question indeed because we we were quizzed very hard on 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 that sort of this time last year, and I, I remember sort of when we started our, our our full year presentation this time last year, we got a brilliant set of results. It was the best ever year, you know, 2019 full year, and when we sort of started our presentations, nobody wanted to listen to them. They just wanted to know about COVID and what the impact would be. So, and one of the key mm. questions was around arrears. So, you know, and I had people 12 months ago saying to me, Dorian, well, you know, the newspapers are saying that, you know, rent arrears could, could climb as high as 40, 50, 60%. At the time, that was just sheer panic, I think, where, you know, there, there were some quite sensational headlines. The reality is completely different. So the reality is that our arrears across the whole of our portfolio, and bear in mind that we, we manage, including Humphreys, we've got over 70,000 properties under management, so we've got good visibility. Um, our rent arrears hasn't exceeded 4%. Um, it normally runs at around 2%. So, you know, we've, we've always got arrears um, um, of a relatively small amount. And, and in my mind, generally arrears don't turn into a, a default. So, so we're measuring arrears and saying it's less than 4%. But in most cases, a tenant wants to keep the roof over the head. The agent wants the tenant to stay in the property. The landlord wants the same. And if the tenants had a blip and you know lost a job or had a financial problem, which resulted in two or three months of, of rent arrears, it makes absolute sense for the parties to come to an arrangement for the arrears to be repaid over a period of time without an eviction um, or, or sort of court action. Um, and landlords, in my experience, have been doing exactly that. In many ways, that's what gives an agent its value. Um, Chris, if I'm talking to you, that's what I don't know who asked the question. And that's what gives the agent um, its value because it's much easier for a third party to negotiate between two parties who are emotionally invested in a, in, a, in in the tenancy. So we can get involved, we broker an arrangement, and then we collect the sort of arrears as the tenant you know makes up for the uh, for the missed payment. So sub four percent. I accept that um, furlough. There are still five million people on furlough. So it's yet to be seen what impact that has, has on our sector or anybody else. Um, what I can say is that um, we, we generally appeal to, um, obviously we, we only generally rent to tenants um, who are employed in the main. We have some sort of housing benefit tenants. And, you know, we, we at, at the average salary of, of a tenant, when we credit check them across our, our portfolio, um, is, is about 27,000 a year. And so, although I'm not an expert on, on furlough and the dynamics of, who exactly is on furlough? Um, mm -hmm. I suspect that um, you know. Although it's a shame, I suspect it'll be lower income um, people who are who are quite badly affected, and you know, by retail sectors and hospitality, etc. Um, there are no indications that any agency chain um, or, or landlord um, is going to be sort of adversely affected in in, in um, as furlough unravels. But you know, I admit that it's very early, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, what are the main financial and operational risks for a franchisor? Well, the sort of, um, I mean, actually, I'll give Louise a bit of a plug here. Louise, I'll cover this one, Louise, but, you know, Louise has worked really hard on putting together a fabulous annual report. And um, in Louise's mind, not as, not, 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 um, you know, everyone should read it, and I, I completely agree. So in the annual report, there's a section that covers all the risk in detail. But, you know, there are there are always operational risks with franchising. What I, what I would say is that, you know, there are some brilliant brands um, that are growing very effectively by means of franchising. We all have the same sort of challenges, um, but the depth of experience in our business, you know, we've been doing this for 25 years. Um, I've been dealing with all of the contractual issues and challenges and operational challenges that we've had for that period. Um, so, you know, we, we, I think it's fair to say, Chris, that probably nothing would surprise us, really, is there? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Just while we're, while we're plugging the annual report, yes. <laughs> I should take the chance to plug it. It is actually available to download from our website. Um, it was put up um, yesterday afternoon, so if anybody wants a, a bigger in-depth dive into the into the numbers, it is there on the PLC website, www.bellwildgroup.com. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so with the um, with the excellent growth we've seen from Belvoir and the acquisitions, is there a possibility that the culture of the business might change? Yeah, that's a good. Good question as well, really. I mean, the the um, so the way way we sort of manage the 
the additional brands. So on the screen, you can see the different <coughs> colours, the different brands. Mm -hmm. What what we've what we've done is differently to to other franchise models, and I guess differently to a lot of businesses really when they acquire. We we've retained the key people in these businesses, and let me explain. So Belvoir was the original brand. So the guy who the the, the de facto MD of Belvoir, the guy who runs the operation, Ian has been with me personally for 15 years. So he, he's sort of taken on a lot of the role that you know I used to do. Um, in Northwood, um, the, 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 we have an MD in that business who's been with Northwood for a long time. He understands the business um, and has strong relationships with franchisees. So we, and, and he was part of the acquisition when we made, made the acquisition back in 2016. Newton Fallowell, the founder is still the chairman of that business is Mark Newton, um, so he's still in that business and still involved on a day-to-day, -day, um, um, as is his son, who is our sort of head of IT and, um, and marketing. Um, Lavelle, um, Lavelle is slightly different, so Lavelle, we've partnered with Newton Fowler, well, it's too small to warrant its own MD, so we've We've partnered it, partnered it with um, uh, with Newton Fowler Well, and exactly the same with Humphreys. On the financial services side, behind the MAB banner, we call the business Brooke. That was the original acquisition that we made. Where the name Brooke came from is Michelle Brooke. She was the founder of a, a, a financial services firm that we acquired. It's always traded as MAB. Um, Michelle still runs it. She's still on board. She's still the MD of the financial services arm. So, so really, I think in terms of culture, I, I've personally worked really hard to ret retain the culture and methods of operating within these brands. Clearly, you've got economies of scale, and we've centralised as much as we can centralise. But we certainly kept the culture within these individual brands as best as we um, as best as we can. You know, ultimately, the culture is um, is managed and, and promulgated by the people in the business who we've retained. Excellent. Excellent. We've run out of time there, Dorian, Louise. Thank you very much for the presentation this evening and taking the questions. And um, we'll say goodbye now. And thank you again.